Francis, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. My name is Marcin Walecki. I'm the head of democratization department with ODEA, and I have a great privilege to be a moderator of this morning session. Uh, the working session four is on a specifically selected topic, ensuring equal enjoyment of rights and equal participation in political and public life. And we are very grateful to participating states and the chairmanship for selecting this very important topic for today's discussion. Um, very briefly, if I can just highlight the key issues which we'll try to cover during this morning discussion. The full participation in political and public life of all groups in society remains a necessary condition for any pluralistic and inclusive democratic system. Equal participation in political and public life is strongly linked to the freedom of association, peaceful assembly, opinion and expression. The necessity for equal and vibrant forms of participation appears even more important at time when frustration, disappointment and low level of trust in political institutions and their representatives appear to have created a growing gap between governments and the people they represent. In order to face these challenges and strive to rebuild confidence in democratic structures and processes, it is important to recognize the fundamental changes and new ways in which people engage, create communities of interest and express opinion, redefining the relationship between the individual and the state in the 21st century. To achieve this goal, OEC participating states should encourage the creation of links between old participatory mechanisms and the new spaces and the force of engagement in political and public life, which are emerging across the OEC region. Let us remember that democratic governance both requires and relies on meaningful and inclusive democratic participation and respect for fundamental freedoms and human rights without discrimination. Before I give a floor to our distinguished introducer speaker, let me just take you very briefly a few, few organizational remarks, starting with the list of um, um, speakers. Uh, um, I'd like to remind you that the list is still open. Um, the list, speakers list is at the back of the head table, and please, I encourage you to sign up for the speakers list. We will close the list um, at the limit of 50 participants. Right now, I've been informed that we have about 28 speakers, so there are still opportunities to register. And we will allocate uh, up to three minutes uh, to each uh, speaker. I would also like to remind the speakers that they can only take the floor in the capacity in which they are registered, and only entities registered on the speakers list can be represented. Um, I would kindly like to remind participants that it's expected that interventions are presented in meaningful, orderly and respectful uh, manner. Please remind that we kindly ask participants to submit their statements before the session to the interpreters and preferably to distribution to ensure that flow of documents reflect the discussion. The statement should be provided to the documentation desk in front of a plenary hall. I'm very glad to see a large representation of our dear colleagues from civil society organizations. I would also like to kindly remind you to please take those seats which are designated for civil society, not occupy the seats which are designated to delegations. Now, allow me to briefly introduce our introducer. I have a great privilege to introduce Dr. Dimitrina Petrova. Dr. Dimitrina Petrova is the co-founder of the UK-based Equal Rights Trust, where from 2006 to 2016, she served as executive director from 1996 till 2006, she was the founding executive director of the European Roma Rights Center, a Budapest-based international human rights organization recognized for its pioneering work on racial equality. There, she led a team of lawyers and advocates to a landmark court victories in over 20 cases before the European Court of Human Rights and hundreds of cases in the other international and national jurisdictions. Dr. Petrova worked as a consultant for numerous international organizations and she also served as advisor to the President of Bulgaria. She was also a member of the Bulgarian Parliament from 1990 to 91, and in that role she was involved in the drafting of the 1991 Constitution. Dr. Petrova, it's a great pleasure to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you, moderator. Uh, distinguished delegates, our dear director, uh, OSCE chair, 
Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, it's my privilege to be uh, trying to introduce you to what seems a, a very broad and very complex topic, which, unlike many other issues, is undergoing very rapid change in our modern times. Uh, first of all, let's remind, uh, let's recall that um, equal participation in political and public affairs is a moral aspiration, but it also is a broadly recognized, realizable political right to which OSCE participating states are committed. I will uh, reduce my written statement, which is rather long to be presented, uh, into um, just a few points, introductory points that I will uh, make. My first point is about anti-discrimination and equality law. Equality and non-discrimination subsumed in it has a triple status in international human rights law. It is a general principle, an autonomous right, and an accessory right. Article 2 of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights taken together with Article 25, which defines the right to participation in political and public affairs, is actually the scope of this morning's session. So we are taking one fundamental political right, the right provided in Article 25 of ICCPR, we are looking at it through the prism of non-discrimination and equality. And this actually is the angle from which we are looking at uh, the reality of uh, human rights in the OSCE region. And my first point is the need for all participating states to have well-developed, comprehensive equality legislation in place in order to be able to give effect to the right of equal participation in political and public affairs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when we look at the global stage and also at the OSCE region, uh, we see a huge difference between the degree to which states have in place such equality law. Some states have well-developed legislation, others have almost nothing in place, not even a legal definition of what discrimination is. And uh, when I have been traveling around the world and talking to governments and even advocates of equality, they would usually point at some piece of uh, framework, uh, aspirational, legislation, something about disability, something about women, and say, oh, we have anti-discrimination law, we have equality law. But actually, the test is whether or not there is an enforceable right to equality, whether or not all prohibited um, grounds of equality that are required by international law are covered or not, and whether it's comprehensive, whether it covers uh, all spheres of life regulated by law, such as employment, education, health, administration of justice, uh, uh, public functions, government, media, and so on. So if you look from that perspective, uh, many, many states have very minimal uh, anti-discrimination and equality legislation. And so my first recommendation and first uh, concern is actually that this is the first thing to look at when we want to take seriously equality in respect to political participation and participation in public affairs. The second uh, point I want to make concerns one particular type of discrimination which has been largely neglected, and this is discrimination on the basis of political opinion. Political opinion is listed among the so-called protected characteristics already in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, and then it has been repeated uh, through all instruments of international human rights law. But even states which otherwise have well-developed equality legislation uh, 
often do not cover discrimination on the basis of political opinion. And if we look at case law, which is a very good test to see whether or not uh, that there is actually is uh, a functioning anti-discrimination law, we see no court cases where, for example, there are people who have gone to court and have defended their right to not be discriminated because of their political opinion. Some people would argue that um, discrimination on the basis of political opinion is actually better dealt with other and under other areas of human rights uh, related law. But I would um, submit that in fact, if we, uh, if we take uh, discrimination on the grounds on the basis of political opinion, that could be a potent legal instrument to approach the issue of inequality of participation in political and public life. My third point concerns the issue of indivisibility, interdependence, and universality of human rights. In a certain way, as, as you know, from whichever angle we look at rights, rights are interrelated. So in order to, um, to give effect to the right to equality in respect to political participation, this itself is premised on respect and enjoyment of a number of other rights. Indeed of all human rights, but those that are particularly relevant to political participation, a freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, freedom, uh, uh, sorry, access to information, uh, freedom of association, perhaps education, and as I said, the, the, the entire age of, range of rights. Uh, now, recent reports by human rights groups paint a very gloomy picture when it comes to the entire OSCE region, and um, I hope there will be consensus among at least human rights advocates that uh, in recent years we are witnessing uh, a certain regress in uh, the respect and enjoyment of fundamental freedoms. And I was uh, asking myself, where has the spirit of the 1989 Vienna and 1990 Copenhagen documents disappeared? Where is that glorious determination of that generation of statesmen and stateswomen who in 1990 in the Charter Paris committed to build, and I quote, consolidate and strengthen democracy as the only system of government of our nations and to the values of pluralistic debates fostering inclusive and effective participation in political and public affairs. Uh, my next point, and I think it's the fourth point by now, uh, concerns the relationship between uh, freedom of expression and equality. Uh, this relationship is critical to uh, the discussion of political participation. Uh, as, uh, as I'm sure you know, states within the OSCE region have a history of difference, of uh, legitimate difference of opinion within the human rights field when it comes to uh, the regulation, the outlawing, or the protection of hate speech, including online hate speech. There has been um, a very strong argument showing that online speech in some ways is actually, can be uh, potentially uh, more powerful and potentially more dangerous uh, than hate speech offline, in offline communications. And experts have shown um, characteristics of online expression such as uh, the, uh, the, the less inhibited nature. People are more likely to just shoot off an email or react like or dislike or fa on Facebook and Twitter and so on. Uh, secondly, the way in which online information persists, unless it's deliberately removed from, um, uh, from platforms, it's there and it's there for a very long time. Thirdly, uh, by its very nature, the trans-border um, character of online speech, which therefore raises the question, do we need a different sort of regulation 
uh, for online expression compared to expression offline. Um, I am of the view that when we go online in the 21st century, we have to take our human rights with us. We should not leave them behind. And the principles should be the same. The principles, that is, uh, although the, on a case-by-case -case basis, there can be a very broad uh, uh, margin uh, as to whether or not to regulate uh, speech, uh, still the principles should be those of, um, in the first place, legitimate purpose and proportionality. Um, my next point concerns the issue of information and statistics. Now, when it comes to actually monitoring progress in the area of political rights and equality in the enjoyment of political rights, um, first of all, where is the information and how rigorous and how evidence-based our contentions are. The issue here is that states are not yet doing a good job in collecting equality-relevant information. And what needs to be happening here is that states, to give full effect to the right to equality of participation, states must collect and publish information, including relevant statistical data, in order to identify inequalities, discriminatory practices, and patterns of disadvantage, and to analyze the effectiveness of measures to promote equality. Without such information, we cannot talk about um, effective policy measures. My sixth point, and very briefly, uh, because uh, I guess I, I'm quickly running out of time, is the issue of youth participation. I think mature, a mature discussion in the 21st century of political participation must also cover children's rights and youth rights. And I mean seriously, children's rights. Uh, the Kids' Rights Index shows that the implementation of child participation rights is impeded by traditional practices, cultural attitudes in the family, schools, and certain social and judicial settings. Children at risk, such as, for example, children in alternative care, are rarely included in deciding matters concerning them, let alone matters of more general interests. And OSC participating states should ensure that the views of children and young people are given due consideration in public affairs through the adoption of appropriate legislation, training of professionals, curriculum reforms if necessary, and of course, awareness, awareness raising. Young people of voting age in many countries have often been accused of being a political consumerist, disengaged, self-centered, cynical, and so on and so forth. And their part low participation in formal election has been pointed at as a symptom of such prevailing attitudes. I think that nothing can be further from the, the truth. And young people themselves have vigorously rejected this view and they have em emphasized that they are not indifferent but they are simply different and that they care and express themselves in a different way. Millennials, and in fact, we are now 2070, so even the children of millennials, so those who are 17 or less, are, as we speak, are creating forms of political participation that indeed differ from traditional forms. But before turning to a discussion of new forms of political participation, there are many things that can be done by states to. Um, to stimulate young people to take part in traditional political uh, uh, forms, such as formal election, electronic voting, for example, voting online. It is quite ridiculous, I believe, that in the 21st century you have to, we have to go out and queue sometimes for hours and work with those paper ballots. Of course, this can be an option. But there should also be the option of electronic voting. And electro electronic voting, for example, in Estonia, illustrates both the challenges and the successes 
uh, because they have uh, ensured, I believe, both secrecy of the ballot and identification of the voter. And there are many other things to think about. For example, uh, some authors have talked about nudging rather than compulsory elections, which are controversial, though some countries have them. Uh, there could be policies that make it so difficult to opt out of voting that people simply prefer by default to vote. Uh, there are certain forms, newly developing forms, based online of voter education, uh, voter advice, such as the VAA. Uh, these are voting advice applications where people go online and uh, quickly answer in 10 minutes a multiple choice uh, um, 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 survey, and then they're given advice whom to vote for because there's an uh, actually, the tool is made in such a way as to measure the alignment of their own attitudes and views to the views of certain political uh, parties or political, uh, or, 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 or political candidates. And now, the notion of participation in political and public life is changing in the 21st century with strong implications for democratic society. Uh, first, the notion itself of political participation in our time is becoming broader and richer. We're not only, we're no longer just satisfied to be calculating percentages of women and ethnic minorities in parliaments or in, uh, in government uh, posts. Uh, these days, people want to participate in a much broader way in all stages and aspects of the democratic process from, um, from accessing information to expression of their political positions to organizing and advocating policies to consultations on policies and laws, deliberation, and most importantly, participating in actually making the decisions. And uh, the, the, the new um, information and communication technologies are making it easier in many ways to actually take part in decision making. Um, even um, in, in, uh, uh, such, in a, such a simple way as, for example, during a political debate, uh, electoral debate, uh, real-time fact-checking of politicians' uh, statements uh, can be a very powerful tool of people making up their mind whether or not to trust a certain politician. Uh, now, in order to, um, because this is an uh, endlessly uh, fascinating discussion about new uh, information and communication strategies and the role of the internet and the social media and how uh, they impact on democratic participation, I will limit myself to just uh, uh, asking you this question as a question for reflection. Um, uh, is internet uh, a, and the new communication strategies, uh, is it something that fosters equal participation in political and public affairs? Is it something that makes us better informed citizens? Or is it, as many critics say, actually debilitating the political sphere and um, uh, uh, making more harm than good? Uh, when I have looked at the literature on this issue, I think that um, th th I'm amazed at the degree of polarization of views on this issue. So on one hand, there are many enthusiasts uh, of, the, um, uh, of the new ICTs and the internet who point at things like internet being creating a, cul a culture of sharing, allowing everyone's voice to be expressed, providing universal and inexpensive, uh, inexpensive access to the, uh, for the powerless, uh, despite, of course, the remaining digital divide, that it's difficult to, uh, uh, to subject to censorship uh, if it provides anonymity for, for, for the user, that it's uh, being ultra pluralistic with information coming from an avalanche of many different sources, uh, that uh, the internet can also burst mainstream bubbles 
for example, uh, politicians, maybe OSCE itself, I don't know, live in a sort of a bubble, uh, quite distant, remote from the real world, uh, but online communities, digital communities, have their own way of mobilizing and challenging mainstream organizing, including political organizing, and we have witnessed that in, we have witnessed that recently in many countries big time. So there are many, many things to be said uh, in favor of democratic, of the democratic potential of the internet and, the, and the, of the new technologies. Uh, visionaries of Silicon Valley talk about forms of direct democracy, tools, online tools, which make it possible to engage in deliberative decision making, such as the California re uh, uh, record card and, and other mobile apps that make this possible, forms of direct political participation. Um, there are people who have introduced the concept of liquid democracy, a form of direct de democracy where we uh, actually can uh, vote by proxy and can even create proxy chains. Uh, there's the concept of uh, uh, of wiki democracy, um, and so on and so forth. And actually, uh, who knows, uh, techno-utopia of uh, political, democratic political participation can be writing itself uh, in real time. Uh, in, 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 uh, and uh, all these people have a lot of interesting things to say about the democratic potential. However, if we look at the critics. The critics point at features of the uh, online political communications, such as how shallow and superficial such participation can be, how people tend to retweet and to forward and to email exactly those views they agree with, therefore uh, uh, falling into a kind of digital tribes how there is no debate and dialogue across those uh, digital tribes, lines, how then the internet, and that's of course the most worrying thing and most serious thing, can actually ensure um, total surveillance of everybody's communications uh, in the post-Snowden world, and we know how many states have been seriously uh, accused of uh, monitoring their citizens, uh, and uh, also very worryingly the possibility for a tyranny of the majority. So what is then uh, the, the new technology? What is the internet? And my position, my view is that, um, so the question is, can both they be right? And I think that yes, they're both right. Uh, there's, uh, uh, the, the, there's both potentials are in place. And much as they have been extolled as the gateway to a democratic participatory utopia, or feared for their potential for totalitarian surveillance by Big Brother, in one essential respect, the information and communication technologies of the 21st century, in their captivating complexity, are descendants of the humble Stone Age acts. They are tools. Which way they strike is up to the user. Internet is neither democratic nor anti-democratic in itself. It's neither egalitarian nor elitist. It will take a sustained effort by who? By stakeholders, by governments, by democrat democracy stakeholders to utilize its democratic potential and limit its perils. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed uh, for excellent remarks. Um, we agreed with uh, Dr. Petrova that uh, remarks would be submitted later on to a documentation center. So I'm not going to, to summarize all those points now, but thank you very much indeed for particularly pointing out to issues with anti-discrimination equality legislation, um, bringing attention to the issue of youth political participation, giving all those remarks on e-democracy, on new forms of political participation. Um, so really, we very much appreciate the re those remarks. I would like now to open the floor to the speakers. Um, we have 27 uh, speakers registered on the speaker list. Um, this allows us to allocate 
three minutes to each um, presenter, speaker. Uh, in normal life, I'm a very nice uh, person, but I am a very strict moderator during the session. So please uh, stay with, with uh, three minutes. Um, and I would like to give a floor um, now to um, Spain on behalf of the European Union, um, followed by the Commonwealth of the Independent States. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm honored to speak on behalf of the European Union and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and Andorra. Equal and effective participation in political and public life is critical for democracy. The rule of law, social inclusion, economic development, gender equality, and for the realization of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. At the same time, those very rights, inter alia, to freedom of expression, to peaceful assembly, to freedom of association, to education, and access to information, are among the essential conditions for equal participation in political and public affairs and must be promoted and protected. However, Many citizens continue to face obstacles, such as discrimination, including multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination in the enjoyment of the right to participate in political and public life, as well as in the enjoyment of other human rights that enable it. Women, persons belonging to marginalized groups of mi or minorities, and persons in vulnerable situations are among those who are most affected by discrimination in political and public affairs. The 1991 Moscow document commits OCE participating states to promote equal opportunity for full and equal participation of women and men in all aspects of political and public life and decision-making processes. It recognizes that women's representation is not an end in itself, but a condition of development towards a more representative democracy, a more proactive and socially equitable society and state. Although, although significant advances have been made in this respect, women continue to be underrepresented in public institutions, particularly in decision-making position at all levels. Women representation in parliaments in the OC region now stand at an average of 25%, which remains insufficient. In addition, there is a wide variation among participant states with regard, with regard to implementation of commitments on gender equality and political participation of women. In the field of peace and security, the United Nations Council Resolution 1325-2000 calls for full and equal participation of women in decision-making with regard to conflict prevention in post-conflict reconstruction, as well in all efforts for the maintenance and promotion of peace and security. Furthermore, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2242 renewed the call on regional organizations to work on the inclusion of women in peace and security issues. The 1991 Moscow document also commits participating states to ensure the protection of the human rights of persons with disabilities and the equal opportunity to participate fully in the life of the society. Obstacles in assessing data, legal and administrative barriers, in accessible processes and information, and a lack of awareness about political rights can be deny persons with disabilities the opportunity to participate in political and public life. Enhancing participation in public and, po and political life stand at the core of the OC commitments pertaining to Roma and Sinti persons. The action on improving the situation of Roma and Sinti persons with the OC area, later reinforced with a two ministerial council decision on enhancing its implementation, also calls on the participation of states to promote effective participation of Roma and Sinti persons in public and public life, with particular attention to the effective and equal particip participation of Roma and Sinti women. In many OC states, OEC states, we witness a general decline in, in traditional forms of political participation, declining voter turnout, low rates of youth uh, members in political parties, which runs parallel to youth disengagement from politics. One key challenge is to uh, ensure that youth uh, remains politically engaged and in power with a framework of existing democratic institutions, as well with the new forms of uh, online political participation. Furthermore, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2250-2015 on youth, police and security urges to consider ways to increase inclusive participation of youth in the decision-making at all levels for the prevention and resolution of conflicts. Finally, the European commends the efforts of, of the year in, pro, in providing technical support as a means of assisting participating states to comply with OSI commitments regarding equal enjoyment of rights and equal participation in political and public life. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed, and I would like to encourage all delegations to submit their statements to the Document Distribution Center. Now I would like to give a floor to Commonwealth of Independent States, Education Monitoring Organization, uh, followed by Delegation of U.S. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Alexei Semenov. I am a political scientist. Uh, today we are discussing the ensuring equal enjoyment of rights. And I would like to raise the issue of ensuring right to equal access to justice in Eastern Europe. Uh, the principle of equal access to justice is of exceptional importance uh, since all other principles of justice are meaningless if the right of citizens to have access to justice is not ensured. Uh, equal access to justice is the fundamental of the modern court's concept of justice. However, the problematic issues of ensuring equal access to justice still exist, uh, in particular uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, I would like to consider the cases of Latvia and Estonia. The main problematic issues in Latvia and Estonia have to do with uh, the phenomenon of non-citizens and discriminative uh, language state policy of these countries, which cause inequality in access to justice. Uh, Non-citizens in Latvia and Estonia are individuals who are born and uh, permanently live there, uh, but nevertheless are not citizens of Latvia or Estonia or any other country. Non-citizens do not have voting rights and restricted in social and economic rights. The number of non-citizens in Latvia is about 12% of the total population, and about 6% in Estonia. Uh, there is information about cases when courts in Latvia simply do not accept uh, claims by non-citizens for protection against all forms of discrimination. Uh, so, non-citizens cannot defend in courts the right to be represented in government, to access the jobs, to be engaged in certain professions, uh, to have equal salary for equal work, etc. Um, Estonian authorities have made some efforts to ensure equal access to justice and expand the official uh, opportunities for using the minority uh, languages. Uh, earlier, application, uh, uh, earlier applications to uh, the court field in Russian were rejected. The Estonian Parliament uh, has recently passed a law authorizing applications in court in the languages of national minorities. However, it should be noted that uh, these measures are not sufficient to adequately ensure all the civil rights of the non-Estonian residents of the country. Uh, more detailed information uh, you can find in the CSIMO report, the problematic issues of access to justice in Eastern Europe. Um, please find it at desk with NGOs documents. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for observing the time limit. I would like to give a floor now to the delegation of United States of America, followed by the Russian Federation. Thank you, moderator. In the United States, most election law is governed by state and local authorities, which provide crucial oversight and protection for elections in their jurisdictions. That protection is supplemented by the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, which works at the federal level to protect civil and constitutional rights of all Americans. In particular, the Civil Rights Division enforces federal statutes that protect the right to vote. The division regularly evaluates its enforcement tools, including litigation, to ensure that the division is meeting current challenges. Protecting the voting rights of all Americans includes protecting against discrimination in voting based on race or need for language assistance and protecting voting access for service members serving away from home as well as American citizens living abroad. We also have strong legal guarantees to ensure voting rights for persons with disabilities. Polling stations are required to be accessible and include specialized equipment to assist voters. Voter enfranchisement and election integrity are subjects of robust debate in the United States. The Civil Rights Division actively monitors elections for compliance with federal law. In the November general election, the division coordinated the deployment of more than 500 personnel to monitor elections in 67 jurisdictions in 28 states for compliance with federal voting right law. The division monitors elections throughout the country and throughout each year to ensure compliance with the federal voting rights uh, statutes. No voting system is perfect, so it is incumbent upon all of us to constantly reevaluate our policies and procedures to ensure best practices are incorporated. 
For American citizens who wish to run for office, the various procedures and requirements are generally modest. Although only natural-born U.S. citizens are eligible to be president, naturalized U.S. citizens are eligible for all other elected positions in the federal government. Candidates are often not required to have political party affiliation or support in order to run for office, whether local or national, so barriers to participation are low. In addition, few legal restrictions exist to joining or starting political parties or affiliated organizations, including NGOs, news or opinion outlets, or others. America's NGOs cover a wide swath of political and social issues and provide opportunities to voice political opinions or take part in activism on any issue. Journalists publish opinions online and in print, adding to the multifaceted political discussion that characterizes America. There's no perfect system that guarantees 100% participation in all political processes. We make every effort to ensure that the highest number of citizens can easily and meaningfully participate in our political processes. We also assess our efforts on a regular basis to ensure that constitutionally guaranteed protections for political participation are adequate and meet the needs of our dynamic population. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Now I'd like to give a floor to the Russian Federation, followed by Western Trace University Graduates Association. Thank you. Thank you, Moderator. Restrictions to the equal enjoyment of rights and equal participation in political and public life are found in various OSCE member states. To our mind, the most serious flaws are imperfect electoral systems, the fact of statelessness, and limited access to information. In the United States, there are massive uh, violations of electoral rights, a country where, which poses as a bedrock of democracy. The U.S. Constitution does not guarantee voting rights to all American citizens, and decisions concerning who has the right to vote is largely left to the discretion of individual states. Currently, around 4 million U.S. citizens do not have the right to vote in the present elections. These are people who live in the so-called non-incorporated American territories, where residents can elect delegates to represent them only to the House of representatives, not to the Senate, and uh, these delegates do not have full powers. More than 600,000 uh, people still do not have the right to elect plenipotentiary representatives with voting rights in the Congress in uh, the District of Columbia. They only vote during the presidential elections. Around 6 million Americans are deprived of voting rights due to the fact they have a criminal record or due to excessively uh, cumbersome procedures in terms of recovering their civil rights. Uh, sometimes electoral commission officials decide for themselves and unlawfully that some people are unworthy of being part of the electoral process. There is no single federal body responsible for elections either. And um, there is no single notification system for the registration of voters. Around 24 million entries, that's around 13% of all entries on electoral lists are either erroneous or out of date. And even individual uh, NGOs put the number of non-registered citizens at 58 million people. The next state I would like to talk about is Estonia. For decades, Estonia's leadership has been uh, giving advantages to representatives of the titular nation, and Estonian nationalistic forces, with the full support of the government, have been squeezing the political activities of the Russian-speaking communities. Statelessness remains a major problem, and uh, Estonia ranks 10th in the world in terms of the number of stateless persons living there. At the start of 2017, there are around 80,000 non-citizens, or 6% of the population in Estonia. Since the only in, on the 1st of January 2016 did amendments to the law and citizenship take place, and they simplified the naturalization process for under 18s. And the amendments that were made were taken under a lot of pressure from the UN and the Council of Europe. That does not chime well with the uh, recommendations made by the OSCE High Commission on National Minorities. The unequal representation of titular and non-titular communities in local self-government remains a major problem as well. For Russian districts, you need to gather 6,000 votes, for instance, whereas in Estonian ones, you need 2.1 thousand. So that's a clear case of discrimination. The situation concerning uh, human rights in Latvia is also very bleak. The ruling coalition is continuing to build a mono-ethnic form of government. 
when Riga signed, ratified the Framework Convention of the Council of Europe on the Protection of National Minorities in 2005, there were two reservations that were made uh, according to which uh, the Convention's provisions whereby national minorities should be able to interact with authorities in their mother tongue uh, will not benefit from that right. Non-citizens do not, therefore, benefit from the rights that are covered by the Council of Europe Convention. There are around 242,000 non-citizens in Latvia, so the problem is, made, is uh, very significant there as well. That's around 11% of the uh, population. And the bleak situation is confirmed by official statistics. The number of people who are granted citizenship is shrinking every year. And it appears that the Latvian authorities are determined to uh, reduce the number of non-citizens, but only through natural population decrease or emigration. This has multiple consequences also on the emotional plan. We believe that measures need to be taken to address these situations. We will disseminate our, the full version of our text. Thank you. Now I'd like to give a floor to Western Thrace University Graduates Association, followed by the delegation of Kyrgyzstan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Full and effective political participation is an essential component of a peaceful and democratic society. The 1990 Copenhagen document, UN Declaration on Human Rights, and other relevant documents state the right to political participation and representation of minorities. The case in Western Trace, however, is not in line with the provisions of the above-mentioned documents. The Turkish minority of Western Trace in Greece is inadequately represented in the society's policy and decision-making system. After the minority elected an independent MP in 1989, a new electoral law was introduced in Greece, which set a threshold of 3% of a nationwide vote for a party and for an independent candidate to be represented in the parliament. Under the current electoral law of reinforced proportionality, political parties and independent candidates cannot enter the parliament unless they obtain at least 3% of the votes throughout the country, although they may have enough votes to get electoral seats in specific electoral districts. This provision hinders full and effective participation of the Turkish minority in the political system. Since the introduction of the 3% threshold, the minority was forced to run candidates with national parties, even though all these parties oppose the minority's major demands. 3% of the total population of Greece means nearly 300,000 votes, whereas the total population of the minority is estimated about 150,000. Regarding this issue, two days ago during his press conference at the Thessaloniki International Fair, the leader of Union of Centrists, a Greek political party with seven seats, Vasilis Levendis underlined that the main reason for keeping the 3% electoral threshold is to prevent the party of the Muslim Turkish minority in Western Trace from entering to the Greek parliament. Mr. Levendis stated that the total amount of minority votes ranges between 1.8 to 2.2%. He also added that if the number was 5%, then they would support the rising of the threshold to 5% mainly for the, a simple reason. It is for the interest of Greece to keep Muslim party out of the Greek parliament. It would, be ha it would have been a negative phenomenon, the existence of political party composed of exclusively by Muslims, Muslim MPs. Ladies and gentlemen, Greece has been governed su by such a racist approach with Muslim Turkish complex for a long time. Therefore, we call upon the Greek state to take all necessary steps in line with international standards in order to ensure the effective and full participation of the Turkish minority of Western Thrace to the political life in Greece and to withdraw 3% electoral threshold. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. And now I would like to give a floor to the delegation of Kyrgyzstan, followed by Vienna Academic Bund. Thank you very much indeed. Participants, uh, 
We'd like to provide brief information about um, how we ensure the implementation of equal rights in political life in Kyrgyzstan. The Kyrgyz Republic is made up of, um, or rather is signed up to more than 40 international treaties and agreements uh, which uh, provide for the effective implementation of human rights. These include organizations such as the OSCE and the UN. All of the political rights are enshrined in our constitution, the right to elect, to be elected, to represent, uh, um, and to be represented by the executive bodies of a government. The other rights are such um, include the right to assemble, the right to form trade unions and others, the right to appeal to state bodies, uh, the right to be represented, the right to strike, the right to assemble, to meet and to picket. All of these are enshrined in our legislation. And in terms of legislation, it guarantees the rights of citizens to vote and to be elected. There is no limitation on uh, who can stand and uh, there is a limitation on the violation of, uh, there is a prohibition of the violation of these rights. We also have over 20,000 non-commercial organizations registered which are available uh, on the website of the Ministry of, of Justice for Inspection. The work of the High Commissioner of for national minorities is something that we have cooperated in. We are cooper we are we are harmonizing the relations between our ethnic minorities. Almost twenty six percent of our country's population is made up of national ethnic minorities. And the protection of their rights is a key part of life in our country. Measures are being taken to ensure due representation. We are constantly developing the legislation to protect their rights and extend representation for women and ethnic minorities, ensuring that they are included on the candidates list for political parties. In 2015, eight national, eight national ethnic minorities were included in the parliament's makeup. There are also measures to ensure balanced representation. For example, no more than 70% of representatives of one gender. I'd also like to note that there is broad representation of women in the uh, high positions in state structure. For example, the uh, president of the uh, high court, the uh, two female ministers, uh, vice, pre vice prime minister as well. We have conditions in the country to ensure that the representatives of ethnic minorities can uh, work in the law enforcement agencies, work in government, and work in local and national government. The Assembly of the peoples of Kyrgyzstan has been working for more than 20 years. This brings together 28 ethnic minorities and its work is to promote the culture and language of other peoples living in our country. In our civic life, we also see um, those with disabilities represented and they are represented in the high legislative bodies of the country. In the last government, uh, the average age was 40 years, so we are representing youth as well in our government. Thank you very much indeed. I would like to encourage delegations to submit their written statements to the distribution center. Thank you very much. The next on my list is the Vienna Akademiker Bund, followed by Latvian Human Rights Committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Henrik Clausen, speaking on behalf of Wiener Akademiker Bund in Austria. The annotated agenda for this session stresses the need for all groups in society to participate fully in the po political and public life of the society. While countries west of Vienna have generally created conditions that permit all citizens to fully enjoy their human rights and fundamental freedoms, some groups still have disproportionately low participation rates. 
One specific problem is the participation of Muslim voters, which remains dramatically lo lower than that of other religious or ethnic groups. In Denmark, where typically only 10% abstain from voting at general elections, in immigration-heavy areas, it is normal that more than 30% of the voters do not show up at the polls. This is a very challenging category of voters. There can be a wide variety of reasons for this, including literacy problems, lack of confidence in candidates of a different ethnicity than their own, distrust of government due to experience from their countries of origin, lack of understanding about how democracy works, or radical imams preaching that democracy is haram, that means forbidden for Muslims. Then, democracy is much more than just casting a vote once every four years. The beef of democracy is to elect representatives that care for the citizens between elections, and then, address, then contact the politicians when any grievances arise. Not understanding or appreciating this leads to frustration with democracy as such, or even rejection of it. This must be prevented. Since speaking against democracy and man-made law is essentially a political act, not a religious one, persons and organizations doing so must be categorized as political actors, not religious. Speaking against democracy should cause any organization register us as religious to lose that status and designation. Doing so would, pre would remove significant impediments to participation and prevent anti-democratic pre preachers from usurping undue political power under the guise of religion. Wiener Akademikerbund therefore recommends that religious organizations working against democracy be recategorized as political that efforts to replace constitutional law with Sharia be considered a punishable offense, and that foreign preachers advocating non-constitutional law shall not be granted religious status. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for observing time. Now I would like to give a floor to Latvian Human Rights uh, Committee, followed by delegation of Portugal. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, in this June, Local elections took place in Latvia, and for a seventh time in a row, a significant part of the population was not able to participate, mostly because of statelessness. Now, ethnic minorities are 40% of the population of Latvia, but they are only 29% among citizens of Latvia. Moreover, uh, when we have statistics about the candidates who stood for those elections this year, only 6% of the candidates have indicated uh, that they belong to an ethnic minority. Even if we assume that every candidate which did not use the opportunity and did not in indicate any ethnicity would be belong to ethnic minorities, all of them together are only 23% of the candidates for this year's election. What is done now by the government in this area? Uh, while OSC recommended wider use of minority languages in election materials, uh, currently the Parliament has uh, supported in the initial consideration uh, the amendments to administrative violations codes, which introduce new punishments for sending bilingual bulletins and information catalogues to people. Uh, moreover, uh, in the beginning of this year, the major of the capital city of Riga was fined by State Language Center for using not only Latvian language, but also Russian and English in municipal social media accounts. In accordance with the amendments currently under consideration, it could be possible also to remove him from office for such a victimless offense. Moreover, in December, for the first time, one local councillor was removed from his seat uh, for allegedly not speaking Latvian language good enough by the Supreme Court. Although he was elected three times in a row, and now he is elected the fourth time in a row, and uh, it is expected that he will be checked again. Finally, about the issue of discrimination on basis of political opinion. 
uh, for the sixth time in a row, these local elections were without participation of the people who were active in the Communist Party and some other opposition organizations in 1991, when those were legal organizations, despite the fact that in 2006, the European Court of Human Rights and Latvian Constitutional Court both said that the prohibition must be lifted in uh, the nearest time. For the details of our report, please consult the website with the report from the session three. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to give a floor now to Portugal, followed by Romania. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. I would like to avail myself this opportunity to make a few remarks on the very important topics of today's session, concerning specifically the Portuguese experience related to women's leadership and political participation. Our democracy being relatively new, it was only after the 1976 revolution that the, new, the newly adopted constitution established equality between men and women in all fields. For the first time in 79, we had a woman as prime minister, the second ever in Europe. Mrs. Pinta Silgo afterwards was also the first woman to run for president of Republic of Portugal, indeed with a very, very impressive political career. Some years after the revolution, actually 30 years after the revolution, in, 20, in 2006, it was adopted the parity law, establishing quotas for the participation of women and men in the different lists for elections, ensuring a minimum of participation of 33% for each sex. This law is applicable for our national parliament elections, for the European parliament elections, and the and also for the local elections. The, the law was be, has been recently subjected, subjected to an evaluation, which was also presented last spring at the OSCE Human Dimension Committee as a Portuguese national voluntary report. Although figures show that uh, since the adoption of the referred parity law, women's participation has increased in various levels, much remains to be done. Let me ensure that the Portuguese government remains strongly committed in the full and enlarged participation of women in the public and political spheres, and I personally hope to see more women elected at the, the next local elections on the 1st of October. Real representation and inclusiveness are not only reflected in numbers in statics. We deem essential to have greater and more active women's interventions in key areas of political activity, in the different levels of the decision-making positions, and in the government itself, where today we, women are quite well represented already. To conclude, I, I want to underline that political parties have been also engaged to fulfill these objectives in the different sides of the political specter, spectrum of our political life in Portugal. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for those important remarks. I would like to give the floor now to Romania, followed by Andorra. Romania would like to thank Spain for delivering the statement on behalf of the European Union. In my national capacity, I would like to reaffirm the importance of implementation uh, of the OSCE commitments in the field of empowerment of women and share with you uh, Romanian experience in that regard. The National Strategy for Employment 2014-2020 established as a priority goal the increase of women's participation in the labor market, including support measures to reconcile work and family lives. This course of action facilitates women's professional reintegration, including the promotion of entrepreneurship and programs like Second Chance to acquire the skills and qualifications required by an evolving labor market. An important role in the successful performance of activities which have been undertaken under the national strategy for gender equality is uh, performed through partnership between authorities and social partners, trade unions and employers' organizations, non-governmental organizations, and other interested partners in the implementation of projects. The Romanian Ministry of Economy, Commerce, and Relationship with the Business Sector runs the national multi-annual program for developing entrepreneurship among women from the small and medium enterprises sector. The main objective of the national multi-annual program is the stimulation of starting and developing 
private business run by women while facilitating their access to financing. Particular attention is paid to maintaining a balance between family and professional life and fighting existing preconceptions at the local level. As for a balanced participation of women and men in political life, I would like to inform you that there are two initiatives discussed in the Parliament right now, proposing a minimum quota of 30% for each gender on any party lists for both local and general elections. So far, the Senate has adopted these measures, and it is now up to the Chamber of Deputies to debate and vote. The obvious conclusion, Mr. Moderator, is that work must continue to ensure equal participation in political, public, and economic life. I thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I would like to give a floor now to Andorra, followed by the Czech Republic. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I will speak in Spanish. Mi delegación. My delegation subscribes to the statement delivered on behalf of the EU. I would like, in my national capacity, to share two cross-cutting measures uh, taken as an example of uh, Andorra's government's firm commitment to making progress in terms of the full participation of all citizens in public and political life. First and foremost, the Andorran Parliament in January 2015 adopted a white paper for equality. The idea was to gather information on the real situation in terms of equality in Andorra and consequently to design a strategy in order to promote from within the parliament and the other public institutions a cultural of equality. Similarly, a new area for political uh, for equality policies was established and this new unit is in charge of all policies in that field. The white paper for equality was presented last July and it is the result of a collective effort which, since the very outset, benefited from the support of public associations and private associations, in particular the following ones. Youth, women and elderly people, persons with disability, the LGBTI community and others. Consequently, this is a, an inclusive document that is absolutely key for addressing flaws and for charting the way forward for our work on equality. I would also like to point out that the Andorran government has raised education to one of its top priorities at the multilateral level. We are guided by the principle that youth is the driving force of our societies and this is based on human rights and democracy and anchoring them in that system is the best long-term guarantee for fighting against discrimination and ensuring equal opportunities, inclusion and the active participation of all citizens in the political and public life of our country. Therefore, we would like to point out that we have three educational systems in uh, Andorra. We have the Andorran one, the Spanish one, and the French one, and they are all f free of charge, and you can choose whichever one you prefer. Also, there are a number of initiatives that we have taken at the multilateral level in order to promote education, such as our participation in the Global Citizenship Initiative in the framework of the United Nations, and we are also following up on the Council of Europe's work in this field. That was Andorra's priority, in fact, when Andorra chaired the Council of Ministers of the Council of Europe in 2013. To conclude, I would like to say that during the previous legislature, Andorra had perfect parity within its parliament with 50% of women and 50% of men. This fact is quite remarkable given that we did not introduce gender quota in our legislation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this important information. Now I'd like to give a floor to Czech Republic, followed by Set My People Free. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. The Czech Republic fully aligns herself with the statement delivered by the European Union. Promotion of equal participation in political and public life is a long-term priority of the Czech Republic. We support a strong engagement of the European Union in this area, be it through its program tools as a European instrument for democracy and human rights or European endowment for democracy. 
our active engagement in this area of participation uh, rights would not be possible and effective without a very close uh, cooperation with NGOs. Let me mention just a few examples. Um, uh, Czech NGO uh, called Democracy 2.1 focuses on uh, the importance of modern and innovative participation methods uh, concerning, for instance, budget planning at the municipal level. Uh, we also welcome the Carter uh, Center's effort uh, to draw uh, the UN's attention to closer uh, to the promotion of uh, election rights. We are following with interest uh, the IFAS efforts uh, to set up um, regional framework, uh, frameworks to focus on electoral dispute resolution issues. In May uh, 2017, the Czech uh, Republic assumed that, assumed the chairmanship uh, of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. Uh, during our chairmanship, we are supporting development of local and regional democracy as one of the core components of democracy. We are focusing on innovative tools that facilitate an effective response by municipalities and regions to today's uh, challenges. Particip uh, participatory democracy is um, uh, the vital basis for uh, citizens' uh, engagement in local and regional public life uh, represents an important uh, theme of our uh, chairmanship. In July 2017, uh, the Czech Republic uh, was elected um, uh, as the president of the UN Economic and Social Council. Uh, the main priority of our presidency is uh, sustainable, resilient, and uh, inclusive uh, societies uh, through participation of all. Fulfillment of uh, the 2030 agenda requires, of course, uh, collective efforts uh, of every part of our society at the local, regional, and global level. Finally, uh, we would like to provide uh, the USC forum with the updated information on Czech uh, Republic's activities in the human, uh, UN Human Rights Council. Since 2013, we have been submitting together with the Netherlands, Botswana, Indonesia, and Peru a resolution on equal participation in political and public affairs, which uh, has been every year adopted by consensus and supported by uh, the overwhelming majority of uh, the OSC participating states as co-sponsors. In September uh, 2016, the UN Human Rights Council decided to request the Office of uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights to prepare draft guidelines as a set of of orientations for the states on the effective implementation of the right to participate in public affairs. We expect the draft guidelines uh, to be presented at September 2018, uh, at the, the September 2018 session of uh, the Council. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for sharing with us this important information. We will be watching for these guidelines uh, with a lot of attention. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to give a floor now to set my people free, followed by crude accountability. Uh, Kamal Fahmi, uh, executive, international executive of Set My People Free, working to abolish apostasy and blasphemy law in Islam. Uh, I, I'm not sure how many people here are aware of, of the case of the governor of Jakarta uh, crime. His crime was that he said that the hadith by Muhammad that non-Muslims cannot rule all over Muslims is weak. For that statement, he was accused of blasphemy. And he is serving now jail sentence in Indonesia. And his crime is uh, blasphemy and also stating, his blasphemy was stating that non-Muslims ruling Muslims is, should be legal. It is not a true law. For that, he is now serving two years in jail, which shows us that in Islam, because Indonesia is the most popular state, Islamic state, that non-Muslims cannot rule Muslims, and that also there is a shock of freedom of speech when you speak against the Islamic law. Uh, yesterday, also, there was a lot of criticism of Central Asian Republic. 
And of course, our goal is to have democracy in the Central African, uh, Central Asian republics. But uh, on the other hand, we are supporting Islamic religious party, which agree with what Indonesia did, uh, shocking freedom of speech, and that non-Muslim should not rule over Muslim. There is no place for atheists or other minorities who believe in Islam. They are second-class citizens. It seems we are not learning from history. We think of Khomeini, who lived in France for so many years. He was rehabbed there, supported, and he went back and started a theocracy, which is even worse than a dictatorship. And uh, I'm concerned that we accept such, such ideologies that non-Muslims are considered second-class citizens. The other story which I want to bring is the story of Tunisia. Tunisia just one, two months ago decided that women should inherit equally as men. Also, they decided that a Muslim can marry a non-Muslim. But you know, when the president decided to make this law in Tunisia, Ashar criticized that. Criticized that there should be no equal inheritance for women as men, and that also that Muslim women cannot marry a non-Muslim while Muslim men marry non-Muslim women. The other I would like uh, to kindly ask you to conclude, please. The other your problem is we also gender segregation is a very big problem. The segregation which happened in America for blacks between black and white gave inferiority complex for black Americans. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I have to conclude your intervention. I would like to remind all the participants uh, the topic of the session and ask you kindly to first of all observe the time, second keep your remarks on the topic. Now I would like to give a floor to crude accountability and then it will be followed by Eurasian dialogue. Crude accountability, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this statement could be called cross-session in a way as it concerns a problem affecting freedom of association, democracy at the local level, and the right to public participation. Environmental defenders are uh, under attack throughout the OSC region, particularly in the countries of the former Soviet Union. Their possibilities, their right to participate in public and political life is increasingly and severely curtailed by the authorities. And this is happening through physical and legal threats, defamation of media, adoption of, of uh, new legislation such as uh, foreign agent laws. The systematic attacks against the Russian NGO Environmental Watch on the North Caucasus are a case in point. Over 70 violations of the rights of those groups took place in the last four years, including beatings, arbitrary detention, arrest, imprisonment, and others. And sadly, this is no unique. Environmental defenders in Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Ukraine have been suffering systematic harassment by the authorities and have seen their ability to participate in public and political life severely limited. My NGO, Crude Accountability, along with the Eco Forum of NGOs of Kazakhstan, just published a report documenting many, documenting many such cases across the former Soviet space, and this report will be distributed. Now, all these countries, except Russia, have ratified the Orus Convention, and in many cases, they have put in place procedures and institutions that, on paper, should guarantee the right to public participation. However, a procedure or a structure without the civil society organizations to use it will amount to mere window dressing. We believe that the right to live in a healthy environment is a human right, and that there is a fundamental link between this right, the issues it refers to, and a wide range of fundamental human rights, particularly economic and social. Therefore, these attacks on environmental defenders are not just damaging, I don't know, as an ecosystem or an endangered species, or uh, biodiversity, and other realities that may sound very far away from our everyday life. They're damaging a whole political and legal setup. And in addition, 
if even environmental rights, which we all consider non-political or non-controversial up to a few years ago, are now under the same attack as political, traditional political rights, then we may well be entering this uh, human rights gloomy winter, as one of the experts talking at the plenary said two days ago. Therefore, we want to call on the OSCE to raise the visibility of environmental rights and of the ways to exercise such rights, such as public participation. And this should include giving more space to environmental rights in future human dimension meetings and other activities. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your intervention. I would like to give a floor now to Eurasia Dialogue, followed by uh, Resource Center for Women, Marta. Good morning. Uh, there is a difficult situation with human rights in Tajikistan. I would like to emphasize that there is a danger in terms not only with human rights. This goes beyond the legal analysis and the human rights topics. It affects wider spectrum. The United Tajik opposition is no more, and the government, after nearly 20 years of trying to participate in the system, has dismantled the major component of the UTO, the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan. The supposed guarantors of peace accord, as well as the United Nations Organization of Islamic Cooperation and Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, have just been following passively as one side of the peace consolidated its position. Stance of main players, which officially called states guarantors of the Tajik peace accords as Russian Federation and the United States in long way of eliminating the United Tajik opposition from the system have been quiet and sluggish. Almost a sole successful peace building operation in the history of the United Nation for two last decades and the nation the, which has at least 6,280 years of history have been forgotten and abandoned by the international community. <laughs> Eurasian Dialogue, Civil Society, a group of lawyers, human rights defenders, and political experts at the OEC Human Dimension Implementation Conference recommends, recommend, first, the time has come to the United Nations and the OSCE and the state's guarantors of the Tajik peace agreement to assist the Tajik government and moderate political opposition in seeking peaceful coexistence. Second, to allow international observers and lawyers to provide legal assistance to detainees and convicts of representatives of Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan and former UTO. And they are lawyers in re reviewing their case. Third, we urge the Office of uh, the High Commissioner for Refugees of the United Nations draw attention to the situation of the supporters of former United Tajik opposition, the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan, and other opposition parties in movement. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much, and I would like to encourage you to submit your statement to the Document Distribution Center. This would allow us to distribute the statement to all participants. Thank you very much. I would like to give a floor now to Resource Center for Women, Marta, followed by International Platform for Global Rights of uh, Peaceful People. Uh, Resource Center, Marta, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, Marta Center works on daily basis for equal opportunities for women and men, boys and girls, on national level, Latvia, but also internationally, specifically in Central Asia. And uh, there are women in our organization that are, belong to different ethnic uh, uh, origins and they face the same challenges and difficulties uh, and the same problems, uh, whether you are Latvian or Russian speaking. But um, uh, I would like to highlight our cooperation with Central Asia and the problems that we have faced uh, there and um, as Central Asian countries are priority area also for Latvia and also for uh, Marta Centers as organization. And uh, we see that um, um, one of the major problems is still prevailing gender inequality um, that uh, 
uh, that hinders women political participation and public uh, participation because how can you participate politically or publicly if you cannot go outside your home without permission of your husband or your mother-in-law uh, it it relates mostly to uh, young women or how uh, how can you be politically active if you have to struggle for li for your life or health because uh, um, domestic viol violence is prevalent in and it's not discussed and it's not um, this uh, discussed as a problem in some countries uh, it's it, 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 there is like silence and and official statement is that there is no violence at all however we know that in all countries in the world there is domestic violence and also that the, uh, who cares about children? These are women. So all the burden of, of child uh, ch giving, giving children and caring of children, it's uh, on women's shoulders. Same time, uh, there is an uh, increase of, um, uh, of uh, no access to education, especially secondary education. There is, uh, um, in, especially in rural areas, uh, prevailing early marriages and um, and uh, women are girls are um, are not getting education that limits their economic opportunities and that's uh, that limits also their political participation and uh, public participation so um, this is these are issues and um, we see that this leads to poverty and radicalization of, of the societies and uh, uh, there are tremendous efforts uh, that civil society organizations are doing to empower young people, to build coalitions, to create more coordinated um, actions, um, and uh, but these are like small scale, and it should be large scale. And uh, uh, I I invite you to discuss more about these issues at quarter past one at meeting room two, where we are going to discuss how to empower women, how to empower young people to prevent radicalization. That's it. Thank you very much, and thank you for observing the time. This will indeed allow us to finish before your side event starts. Now I would like to give a floor to International Platform Global Rights of Peaceful uh, People, followed by Human Rights Movement, Dear Duino, Kyrgyzstan. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, experts. I'd like to raise a question of the full destruction of the left opposition by the government in Ukraine. In July 2014, the Justice Ministry of Ukraine and the Ukrainian State Register uh, was filed a suit to eliminate the Communist Party of Ukraine, which had a support of two million uh, voters. It was based on a lie that the Communist Party uh, wants to undermine the Constitution Constitution, uh, put an end to territorial integrity of Ukraine, uh, make propaganda for war, violence, and that also representatives of the Communist Party constantly uh, urged for the militarization of education. On the 30th of September 2015, the Kiev Administrative Court effectively banned or prohibited the activities of the Communist Party of Ukraine. And after this, former socialists and communists joined the SLS, the Union of Left Forces. The fundamental difference uh, between the SLS and the powers of Ukraine is shown in the following statement. We s would categorically protest against the continuation of war in Ukraine. The failure to apply the Minsk agreement would lead to the uh, destruction and exhaustion of Ukraine. On behalf of the people of Ukraine, we state that those who are most guilty for the war in Donbass are the main or oligarch forces who are earning million, billions from the war. The war is depriving us of our future. It is exhausting our livelihoods and destroying our homes and ultimately uh, will destroy our country. We need to save Ukraine from its impending destruction. If we were able to communicate directly with the electorate, we would come out at least in second place. But we've seen the destruction of the only left-wing party in Ukraine. This is how things have happened so far. On the 22nd of April 2016, Vasily Volga, the head of the SLS, went to a meeting and to address more than uh, 
to address activists. Uh, they were attacked by uh, activists of Azov and Volny Ludi with uh, truncheons and knuckle dusters. They all suffered injury of different degrees of severity. And the SLS was attacked because it was calling for the full implementation of the Minsk agreement. Uh, the police were called to and asked to bring action against those who'd made the attacks, but nothing has happened. Indeed, the Minister of Justice has said that anybody accepting f uh, action against the attacks from the leader of the SLS would be fired. Uh, the powers have decided to eradicate all opposition and this has continued 20th of May 2017 70 uh, the 73 year old um, vice head of the SLS was was arrested and um, I can tell you that uh, there's more information on this, uh, which you can you can see that we have more information on this. Uh, on the 25th of May 2015, a special investigation was called for to ensure equal rights and equal participation in, of all parties and all civil organizations in Ukraine. This is what we would call for. Thank you very much indeed. I would like to give the floor now to human rights movement, Birduno, Kyrgyzstan, followed by Azerbaijan. Uh, Good morning. Thank you very much for this session. Prior to the elections that took place in February of this year in Kyrgyzstan, we would really like the amendments to the Constitution to be repealed, which foresaw that between July and October there could be no pickets or demonstrations near official buildings. Kyrgyzstan is home to uh, 18 different nationalities, and it's a, a striking country with a striking multicultural environment. So I'd like to introduce uh, uh, to Dmitrievna Petrovna the fact that in Kyrgyzstan we would like to take part in political and public life, and our government did actually repeal the uh, foreign agent um, law last year. And this affected a number of deputies in Kyrgyzstan. In terms of women's participation, neither Russia nor Kyrgyzstan have ratified the rule, the Convention on the Rights of uh, Migrant Workers. And following the ethnic war in 2010, it was recommended by a number of UN committees that measures should be taken and that there should be a national action plan that would include gender equality because we still do have to deal with issues like early marriages, forced marriages, and on television, the television channels belong to government structures, we often come to realize that the authorities forget what reality is like on the ground. So once again, as you said, in Kyrgyzstan, civil society should have the right to condemn diktats and to hold officials of different levels accountable. National minorities should also have access to justice, including Mr. Skar, who, Skarov, who has been lacking access to a fair trial for many years now. And we do hope now that with the new government in Kyrgyzstan, they will fulfill the decisions of the UN committees and that they will actually release this person. And we also hope, and this is a source of it, and that would be a source of inspiration and hope for the national minorities in Kyrgyzstan. And when we speak about policies, there are a number of people from different uh, ethnicities, but they tend to not run for office in government structures. So it means that the government structures have a clan-like structure, a family-based structure, and that is uh, very propitious for corruption. So we would like there to be a national dialogue in order to change the situation for the better. Thank you. I would like to give the floor now to Azerbaijan, followed by Golos Movement.
Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Apologies. Uh, first, we'll go Azerbaijan, and then I'll give the floor to Golos. So, delegation Sorry. of Azerbaijan first, please. Thank you. Democracy plays a special role in the development of any country. A country may be economically rich and have natural resources, but if there isn't a good atmosphere in society and no freedoms, then this development will be half-hearted and unstable. Our advantage lies in the fact that we carry out political and economic reforms in parallel. During two days, we discussed and made statements on very important themes about fundamental freedoms. So I would like to give short political view on Azerbaijan political life. The role of political parties in the social political process of the country is essential. After regaining independence, Azerbaijan chose the way of the democratization. It should be noted that now the responsibility and transparency in all areas of democracy is on agenda in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan does its best to ensure equal enjoyment of rights and equal participation in political and public life. Activity of political parties is considered to be one of the key criteria in forming the civil society and democratization of political system. There are 54 registered political parties in Azerbaijan. 11 of them are represented in parliament. It should be noted that the political parties functioning in Azerbaijan differ from each other by their structures, form, methods, and ideology. I would like to draw your attention on important amendments to the law of the Republic of Azerbaijan on political parties. The main substance of amendments and additions to the law is related to the financing of political parties in order to ensure equal rights and participation. According to the amendments to the law, the state financing of political parties, candidates nominated by the 10% of the budget allocated to the Parliament of the Republic of Azerbaijan are divided proportional to the number of votes gained among the political parties, which won at least 3% of valid votes at the last election to the Parliament of the Republic of Azerbaijan. 40% of the funds are distributed among the political parties represented by the, in the Parliament, and 50% proportional to the number of elected deputies. State funding of political parties is a fundamental issue which provides equal rights in political uh, life of Azerbaijan. On the other hand, it, it serves to the transparency and political political uh, transparency of political parties. The draft project was also discussed at the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe and OEC Baku office in 2011. Today, they are uh, and also I would like to draw your attention about the uh, accepted law on participation, public participation. In 2014, Azerbaijan Parliament accepted law on public participation to enhance cooperation breach between civil society and state bodies. According to this law, in all state bodies, there will be created public councils that will be consist of different experts from civil society, media organization, private sectors. It's been already established more than more than five in the state bodies of Azerbaijan. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for those important remarks. Now I'd like to give a floor to Golos uh, movement, followed by Armenia. Thank you. I have an unusual occasion to greet you twice. Okay. Equality of access to political life, and from our point of view, since we are an uh, election observation organization, political life starts from elections. And when person first time came up to the polling station, uh, being a young woman or g girl or man, and he's presented with candies and presents, and uh, elections make them, them, those girls and boys, disappointed because they see that we don't have uh, alternative candidates. In Russia, there exists an outrageous practice of municipal filter. When a candidate has to collect agreement from the incumbent municipal councillors, who in their turn are representatives of the ruling party. In this case, the ruling party reproduces itself due the electoral process, and ordinary people see that and begin to, to, to avoid elections, to disrespect the whole process. Authorities reproduce themselves that violates the very essence of constitutional rights and political rights from the first, uh, 21st chapter of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In this case, a uh, person is not able to run because some guys, some uh, municipal councillors decided that he is not worthy to give their signature and agreement. 
an, an, another very unusual practice of Russian authorities uh, in regard of elections is secret elections. Uh, when authorities see, uh, see that they don't have a lot of chances, they try to hide information about the elections. This, uh, this practice, uh, this tactics was used uh, when the um, speaker of our uh, higher chamber of the parliament, Matvienko, was running in St. Petersburg, where nobody knew actually uh, what she was running. This practice was uh, used recently in uh, Moscow when authorities understood that they don't have a lot of chances and they remove any campaigning, even campaigning about about turnout, about uh, calling people to come and vote. And candidates themselves was doing, ordinary citizens, I myself was putting notices, please come to vote. It was the job of the state and it was job of the authorities and they tried to hit these elections and shut them from the uh, ordinary citizen. Commission, commission, uh, Commission composition, it's another practice when the ruling party and authorities, and sometimes it's impossible to see difference, they organize uh, in a such a manner that maybe 90% of the members of the commission are from the ruling party or through authorities, and they are absolutely sub submersive. They don't, don't report any violations, and they, of course, all their decisions are in favor of the candidates from the ruling party. Authorities reproduce themselves. But democracy is not a toy. Democracy, in such a way, the double-edged sword, and if you play uh, with it, it's, you are cut with low turnout, with uh, humiliatingly low turnout, like it happened uh, in the recent years, and now, let me quote our statement that the low turnout observed in this election, last elections, was caused in the first place by the low level of competition and by the voters' distrust toward the election process and that had developed over the course of recent years. And new leadership of our Central Election Commission, which efforts we greatly favor and uh, support, still unable to break the tendency of those last Yes, democracy without turnout is dead. Political life, and we are talking about here, political life is dead as conclude. well. Thank Please you. Conclude. Thank you very much. And, and apologies, uh, I'm not doing it with pleasure, but I really have to keep time. Um, so I want to remind all the speakers we have a time limit of three minutes. Um, now I'd like to give a floor to Armenia, followed by Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Dimitrina Petrova. Uh, for her thoughtful presentation and present our views on the first specifically selected topic that is under discussion at the HD. Liberty, equality and brotherhood had been three main ideas of the great French Revolution, which largely laid foundation of the modern system of democracy and human rights. History showed that these three principles are effective together and absolutizing one at the expense of the other created restrictive systems, some of which ended up in tyranny. Therefore, it is important to assert that there is no freedom without equality and that there is no equality without freedom. And solidarity, which is perhaps modern equivalent of brotherhood, can be ensured by joint application of these principles. The equality is not merely an individual right, but it's certainly a group or collective right, as it was also stipulated in the annotated agenda. The collective equal rights are one of the important principles of the Helsinki Final Act, wherein it appears in a comprehensive manner as equal rights and self-determination of peoples. In 1989 Vienna document further builds on this principle and confirms that all peoples always have the right in full freedom to determine when and as they wish their internal and external political status without external interference and to pursue as they wish their political, economic, social, and cultural development. Unfortunately, not all participating states have complied with, the, with both international obligations and OSC commitments in respecting the equal rights and self-determination of peoples. There have been cases of use of force against the realization of this right, which led to mass and grave human rights violations and eventually to violent and protracted conflicts. And this has also been case for Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Another form of violation of this collective human right 
is an attempt to deprive people of all means of existence, including through impeding realization of their all human rights, including right to life, economic and cultural rights, right to vote, and so forth. This collective punishment is undertaken by consistent efforts of isolation of people living in conflict areas from the international community, including international organizations promoting human rights. Human rights and fundamental freedoms of people residing in conflict areas should be equally upheld, regardless of the status of the territory, something which is openly recognized in the other important human rights instruments, such as Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In conclusion, I would like to submit a recommendation. We recommend to all participating states to uphold their international obligations and commitments on promoting and respecting the equal rights and self-determination of peoples. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to give a floor now to Ukraine, followed by Election Monitoring and Democracy Studies Center. And I would also like to remind you that we still have a um, speakers list open, so if anyone would like to take the floor, uh, please do register yourself um, and put your name on the speakers list. Now the floor goes to Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ukraine fully aligns itself with the statement of European Union and in my um, national capacity, I would like to attract attention of the HDM participants uh, to, uh, uh, to, the rights, uh, to the rights and freedoms, especially the freedom of association of the persons belonging to Ukrainian minority in the Russian Federation, which is one, uh, uh, Ukrainian minority in the Russian Federation is one of the largest ethnic communities in this country, but unfortunately they cannot uh, they cannot fully implement their rights because of targeted anti-Ukrainian policy in this country and uh, uh, which is uh, going on and uh, it's growing. The ongoing pressure and incitement of hatred through state-owned media pose a serious threat to preserving and development the national identity, cultural uh, uh, and linguistic needs of the Ukrainian community of Russia. The most known and well-recognized Ukrainian global organizations, the Ukrainian World Congress and the Ukrainian World Coordination Council appeared at the so-called patriotic stop list of the undesirable organizations in Russia. Ukrainians cannot realize their rights for, um, uh, for association according to, uh, to the Russian legislation in power. The Federal National Cultural Autonomy of Ukrainians in Russia was dissolved in November 2011. The Association of Ukrainians of Russia was dissolved in May 2012. Established by Ukrainian activists and the Ukrainian Congress of Russia was twice refused to be registered by the Ministry of Justice of Russia, uh, uh, of Russia and instead uh, the new Gongo, uh, Federal National Cultural Autonomy of Ukrainians in Russia with no full representation of, of the regional entities of Ukrainians throughout Russian regions was registered. Ukrainians uh, cannot realize also their cultural, educational, information rights, their rights for political representations. We are speaking about two million citizens of the Russian Federation at the moment. Children of Ukrainian region have no opportunity to study in Ukrainian language and their parents don't know about such an opportunity for them and there is lack of prepared teachers uh, and schools in Russia uh, for studying in Ukrainian language. The only Ukrainian state-owned institution, uh, Ukrainian, culture, uh, Ukra uh, Ukrainian library of, uh, in Moscow was closed. Uh, Ukrainian NGO activists like uh, uh, Viktor Girzhov was banned to entry to Russia. Uh, Valery Semenenko fled from Russia. In Khabarovsk, Natalia Romanenko also, also under pressure of FSB, and there are many other cases. We demand from the Russian Federation uh, to immediately hold persecution of the Ukrainians and their public organizations, including state-owned uh, uh, public organizations and, inst and state-owned institutions which promote Ukrainian culture and public rep uh, representation in the Russian Federation. We also encourage the OEC and its institution to give immediate attention to these foreign trends and assist the Russian Federation to fully comply with relevant OEC commitments on national minorities and their uh, uh, public representations. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Delegation of Ukraine. I would like to give a floor now to Election Monitoring and Democracy Studies Center, followed by Young Citizens Enlightenment Public Union. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Anar Mamadli from Election Monitoring and Democracy Study Center from Azerbaijan. Uh, just a few minutes ago, the uh, delegates from Azerbaijan has mentioned about the legislation which provides uh, the, the, the guarantee for public participation in Azerbaijan, including election rights, freedom of association, and freedom of assembly. However, the reality of the country is different, and it, during last a couple of years, after uh, since 2013, which uh, year the presidential election was held in country. Uh, the freedom of association, freedom of assembly, and the uh, role of political groups, civil society groups, absolutely minimized in country. So there is no, uh, unfortunately, legal and political environment right now uh, for, for, for civil society groups and political groups. So when we, we, uh, we are mentioned about uh, public participation or equal participation, absolutely the election institution is main a key instrument for this purpose. And I would like also highlight that since 2013, when OEC ODIR uh, long-term observation mission has issued its report on, on Azerbaijan presidential election, there were no dialogue during the last four years. So even I, I remember that since 2008, there is no dialogue between Council of Europe, Venice Commission, and Azerbaijan government. However, uh, when we, uh, Azerbaijan parliament adopted several amendments on, on the law, freedom of assembly, freedom of uh, association and election code, it, it is one of Azerbaijan requirements and obligations that the, these inst international institutions should be involved to this process. So I would like also ask about uh, the, the, the follow-up of electoral recommendation issued by OEC Odir during 2013 presidential election. Uh, in contrary, in, during 2015 pre parliamentary election, Azerbaijan government refused to involve uh, the, the, the election mission of Odir uh, to, uh, to, to, to Azerbaijan. Finally, I would like to mention that the political repression, ongoing political repression and ongoing systematic political uh, prosecution against civil society groups, bloggers and journalists, it's absolutely decrease the level of the, 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 the political participation in country and equal, uh, equal participation in country. So this process should be sh somehow uh, should be stopped by Azerbaijan government and Azerbaijan government should respect OEC key principles on freedom of association, freedom of ex expression, which are the fundamental principles for providing of equal participation in country. So uh, finally, I would like also uh, take your consideration, the role of OEC ODIR, role of parliament, OEC parliamentary assembly in this process. It's very important that this institution should somehow adopt uh, the, the, the strategy regarding uh, the solution of uh, the political repression and political prisoners issues in member countries like Azerbaijan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those important comments. Um, I would like to give a floor now to Young Citizens Enlightenment Public Union, followed by Central Asia and South Caucasus Freedom of Expression Network. Thank you very much. My name is Gunel. I am from Azerbaijan. Uh, I will focus uh, participation of women and youth. Uh, Twelve parties are represented in the parliament, and there are 20 women, and one of them is a vice speaker, and other two are the chairwoman of committees. If in 1990 the number of women representative in middle majlis was just 4%, those overall represented in parliament, now it has reached 60%. Azerbaijan is leader among the South Caucasus countries in representing women in parliament. Currently, more than 4,000 women are represented in municipality. Health, education, and culture are amongst the top priority areas where women dominate in Azerbaijan. The Cabinet of Ministers, top of the government, has two women among 47 senior officials in the central executive system. And the total number of NGOs registered is 2,300, and there are more than 50 political parties have been registered. But unfortunately, none of the chairs are female or young. At the present, 30% of municipality members are young. 
and the number of youth organizations has grown 10 times and reached 350. Also, the law on public participation came into force on June. The law fully meets the principles reflected on the code of the best practice of civil society participation in decision making by Council of Europe regarding the public participation. The law creates opportunities for civil society and citizens to make decisions, execute and exercise public control. Mechanism allow individual citizens, even individual citizens, and civil society organizations to participate in decision making process. By the way, I am one of the uh, I am the member of one of the, this um, platform. According to this law, ten central executive bodies and two local executive bodies are acting under public control. Public councils are selected by NGOs and by individuals by themselves. Also, there is open government platform acting actively. My organization is the member of this platform and I have to mention that there are 40 members in the platform and nine of them are state bodies. Of course, there are still problems in women participating and we need to do an advocacy issue on women active participation in society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Now I'd like to give a floor to Central Asia and Southern Caucasus Freedom of Expression Network, followed by Political Movement Group 24. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Azar Asret and I'm a chairman of that organization. So I, I will speak on the minority issues uh, and discrimination against uh, uh, based on uh, race, racism. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention the case of uh, Greece. Uh, while we are here to, uh, three, already three days discussing the issues of ignoring Turkish minority in Greece. Uh, and the uh, Greece official rep representative here uh, twice said that Greece has no Turkish minority, while the country has 150,000 Turkish population. So I, I hope that uh, starting from the, from the US, UK and other leading countries of the world will react to this ignorance. Then, we are here uh, all white people. Why no any country is represented by black representative? Just only France was represented uh, yesterday and before with black representative and others, no. Uh, does this mean that uh, European countries or United States, Canada uh, have no black population? why black people in these countries are uh, discriminated and not represented in the, such kind of uh, events. And uh, we are talking about the integration of uh, national minorities in the countries. I, I would like to give uh, the, to mention uh, two good examples of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, someone was uh, criticizing Kazakhstan for having people's assembly, but I think uh, and I believe that uh, this assembly is very good uh, example for other countries to integrate national minorities. And then uh, some countries, uh, I'd say uh, only one country in the OSC region is uh, mono-ethnic one, and uh, this is not a good example. I mean, uh, Armenia is one of the countries uh, which has just 98% of Armenian population, and this means that uh, this country is discriminating others and, of course, not allowing other, other nationals uh, to participate in their political right. And uh, uh, ending my speech, I, I'm uh, very fearful about uh, uh, Greece to become uh, Armenia like a uh, mono-ethnic country. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to give the floor now to um, Political Movement Group 24, followed by our last speaker on the list, Rights and Freedom of uh, Turkmenistan Citizens. And then I would like to bring to the attention of delegations that they can still exercise their right to reply. Um, and please do register yourself in case you would like to exercise your right to reply. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a political activist of the Group 24. 
After independence, Tajikistan became a full participant in international legal relations, and it took upon itself various commitments uh, with regard to the rule of law, where the rights of human, where human rights were guaranteed. Unfortunately, we see a worsening situation uh, with human rights in our country. Over recent years, we are seeing arrests, uh, convictions, uh, persecution of those who have different views, uh, independent journalists, lawyers, entrepreneurs, and uh, simple uh, citizens of faith. And this shows a lack of equal rights and opportunity for everybody to participate in civil and political life. The civil and social structure in the country can be divided into three social classes. The first class are the members of the ruling clan who are allowed to do absolutely anything, including acts that go beyond the law uh, that serve the interests of that class. Uh, the second class is the class which has some kind of links with members of the ruling class, and they are allowed partially to participate in civil, political, and business life, but uh, within a given within given limits. The third class is that of the simple people who have to live on what they can um, or uh, migrate for labor. They make up 80% of the population and have really no rights, no way of enforcing their human rights, their right to participate in civil and political life. If this is to happen, it's going to be necessary to clearly divide the three branches of government, ensure an independent media, and uh, promote the functioning of civil society in the country. We, unfortunately, have seen the absence or indeed destruction of these elements over the last few years, and the negative tendencies are, all have their root in the destruction of human rights in the country which is unfortunately has not been covered by the international media. International, the international community has not been paying much attention to these processes and their consequences. Organizations such as the OSC has limited its actions in the country. We have not seen a response from the international community to Rahmanova's dictatorial regime. Thank you very much. Floor now to rights and freedoms of uh, Turkmenistan citizens. Thank you very much, moderator. I would like to tell you about how the dictatorship regime can manipulate any form of democratic requirement to serve the purposes of its regime, thereby undermining the fundamental fundamentals of democracy. We, The head of UN Women is a woman, and the head of our parliament is a woman, and the human rights ombudsman in our country is a woman. All that is for um, window dressing, and it conceals the reality of the situation in Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan thus manipulates the requirements to ensure gender equality by uh, using these requirements in such a way as they actually advance the goals of the democracy. The presenter's three daughters and the women who work around him fill, uh, carry out the political tasks and justice them by the clan, thus bolstering the monarchy-like system. Women pay the role of uh, paid actors uh, when asked about the realities of education and the women's situation in the country. There, in terms of national minorities in our country, there is no equality here, and Russian language uh, speaking people in our country 
do not have any significant influence. They do not manage to represent any groups or any, and they're not represented by any groups either or any organizations. So they are basically second class citizens. And you will not see in the parliament or in at the government level people who are of other ethnicities. Only the representative of the titular nation sit on government bodies. In other branches of power, you will not see leaders from minority communities, only representatives of the titular nation. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers for their active uh, participation in the session. Uh, we've concluded this part of our session. Now I would like to uh, give um, delegations uh, the right to reply. I have uh, five delegations on the list. Um, we decided to allocate two minutes uh, to each delegation. Um, and after we conclude with the rights of reply, I have asked our introducer to make some uh, final concluding remarks. Now on my list of uh, right to reply, the first delegation is delegation of the United States of America, followed by Greece. Thank you, Mr. Chairman or Mr. Moderator. We note that the Russian Federation's criticism of the United States appears to be drawn from ODIR's report on our, 19, our 2016 general elections. Russia declined to participate in the observation mission and has itself questioned ODIR's methodology. Contrary to Russia's selective excerpts, the ODIR report concluded that our elections were, quote, highly competitive and demonstrated a commitment to fundamental freedoms of expression, assembly, and association, close quote, and were, quote, administered by competent and professional staff, close quote. The Russian Federation is quite correct that unlike in some participating states, there is no central vertical of power dictating to local election officials. Instead, decisions are made by officials elected by the very constituencies in which the elections are conducted. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ambassador. I would like to give the floor now to the delegation of Greece, followed by the Russian Federation. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, well, in uh, reply to some allegations that have been uh, heard by distinguished NGOs. Uh, first of all, I would like to clarify that uh, in Greece, only one group of person is qualified as a minority, namely the Muslim minority in Thrace, consisting of three distinct groups whose members are of Turkish Pomak and Roma origin. The status of the Muslim minority in Thrace was established by the 1923 Treaty of Lausanne which qualif qualifies this minority as a religious and not a national one. And uh, furthermore, I would like uh, to, see, uh, to state that it's, uh, it creates a lot of surprise to hear uh, representatives of NGOs to, um, to doubt uh, international uh, treaties. Uh, furthermore, in reply to uh, an, another allegation made by a distinguished NGO. I would like to state that uh, in, uh, in Greece, in almost all successive parliamentary elections since 1927, candidates that were members of the Muslim minority in Thrace have been elected as members of parliament with a governing party, the opposition, or in most cases on both sides of the parliament. Currently, there are four MPs that are members of the said minority. Furthermore, the members of the minority do actively participate in all levels of the region's local administration. This continues to be the case following the most recent uh, regional and local elections in 2014. Roughly 120 Greek citizens, members of the Muslim minority, were elected at the local and regional councils in Thrace, among them three mayor, majors in the city, mayors in the city of Ariana, Iasmos and Miki. A quarter of 5% to the state exam systems for civil service has been also established in favor of persons belonging to the Muslim minority with the obvious intention to enhance, to enhance their active participation in the public sector. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. 
Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor now to the Russian Federation, followed by Latvia. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. I would like to respond to the representative of uh, Ukraine. The right of all national ethnic minorities in the Russian Federation is uh, fully implemented in according with our international obligations. In August, we uh, submitted a periodical report to the Commission on the elimination of discrimination where um, we submitted information in writing to this fundamentally important question. And this material is available for everyone's consideration. We would encourage uh, Ukraine to check its information for um, its truthfulness and reliability. The uh, RUD recently uh, adopted a law which prevented the teaching in other languages other than the state language Ukrainian. Now, this is a clear violation of human rights, and uh, the condemnation of this step has been made by a number of different states. Thank you. Floor to Latvia, followed by delegation of Kyrgyzstan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I would like to reply to uh, the remarks made by the Russian delegation and few civil society representatives uh, towards Latvia. It seems, though, that these civil society representatives, uh, these particular ones, have left the room, but I do hope that they at least uh, watch the web stream. Even though Latvia is not a successor state of the USSR, uh, it granted a privileged status and preferential access to citizenship to former Soviet unions transferred to Latvia by the Soviet regime. They are in no way stateless persons. The protection provided to them by the Latvian legislation extends significantly beyond the requirements of the 1954 Convention relating to the status of stateless persons. These persons enjoy the same social guarantees and most of the rights guaranteed to Latvian citizens. They enjoy full protection under the law both in Latvia and abroad. Latvia has on several occasions eased the naturalization legislation. The number of non-citizens has dropped by almost 500,000 people in 2016 if compared to 1995 when the naturalization process began. Naturalization uh, process have been repeatedly simplified and tests can be done in as little as two hours. Latvia continues to encourage non-citizens to apply for citizenship both by adopting legislative measures facilitating naturalization and by carrying out informative campaigns that have yielded results. Whether to use this opportunity to acquire citizenship is an act of individual will. No one can be forced into citizenship. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor now to the delegation of Kyrgyzstan, followed by Azerbaijan. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. I would also like to respond to some statements concerning my country. The 1st of May's uh, district court issued a ruling on uh, peaceful assembly. This question has been examined in court and it responded to multiple requests made by civil society to the uh, authorities, but it concerned citizens who did not take part in peaceful assemblies. Restrictions in our country are in place if the rights of citizens who do not take part in peaceful assemblies are violated, then the, by court ruling restrictions can be imposed. These restrictions do not constitute a blanket ban on peaceful assemblies, but it simply limits the place where assemblies and gatherings can take place. So again, this was based on multiple uh, appeals and requests we received from citizens about the fact that national minorities do not have equal access to justice. I and about the Askarov case. I would like to refer to the United Nations decision on his case when the Kyrgyz Republic was recognized as um, guilty because um, the person in question was arrested on charges of um, his political activities and 
but not of his uh, ethnic origin. And at the same time, the committee's decision was that the, rec the country should review the recommendation on this affair, and the process has been taking place in an open fashion. It involved many representatives from international organizations. All standards and laws for due process and a fair trial were respected, and the right to appeal the court decision remains. On gender, I would like, in a nutshell, to point out that Kyrgyzstan has made great progress in terms of achieving its international and national goals uh, and obligations on gender policy. Currently in our country, we have adopted a program document, which is our national strategy on gender equality with an outlook to 2020. The priorities are women in the economy, access to justice, and political parity. The main events of this program are in the pipeline, and the government has also allotted financing for gender equality. There is also a monitoring group for monitoring the implementation of this uh, by the government. Thank you. Now to the delegation of Azerbaijan, followed by Ukraine. Thank you very much. I would like to exercise the right of reply to Grand Armenian delegation and the NGO here. Uh, it's very ridiculous for me how uh, the delegation, our main delegation, can ask the equal rights in occupied territory of Azerbaijan because the illegal, illegal regime established by Armenian temporarily occupied territories of Azerbaijan is ultimately nothing other than the product of aggression, of occupation, and bloody ethnic cleansing. Only possible way to achieve sustainable and durable solution of the conflict is based on the withdrawal of armed forces of Armenia from Nagorno-Karabakh and other occupied territories of Azerbaijan in an unconditional and complete manner in accordance with the demands of relevant resolutions of the United Nations Security Council, ensuring unalienable rights of Azerbaijan internally displaced persons to return their native lands, restoration of Azerbaijan's territorial integrity and sovereignty within its internationally recognized borders, and peaceful coexistence of Armenian and Azerbaijani communities of Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan within the borders of Azerbaijan. Instead of wasting time here and misleading its own people and the international community, Armenia must seize its policy of occupation and engage constructively in the conflict state settlement process and comply with its international obligations. About the elections uh, or last elections of Azerbaijan here, which is raised here uh, on participation OEC ODIR, I think that that OJ has wrong or unclear information because OEC ODIR sent its uh, experts uh, in order to observe the elections. Again, uh, it should be noted that the nowadays for Azerbaijan responsibility and transparency in all areas of democracy, democracy uh, is on the agenda. Uh, and if the, it's the unlikely that NGO raising that political life uh, in Azerbaijan, because for him, I think that the, uh, the transparency and also the responsibility in such issues like uh, election process is not so uh, on the agenda, I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to give a floor now to Ukraine, followed by Estonia. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, uh, according to the Constitution of Ukraine, only the President of Ukraine and uh, Verkhovna Rada, the Parliament of Ukraine, elected at the general election, can represent the people of my country. This is in the reaction of any cause of any NGO they would like to possess or use, uh, use uh, this uh, opportunity. And speaking about uh, the uh, right of reply of, uh, and the statement of the Russian Federation, I would like to thank the distinguished Russian representative for enlightening us on the situation, on the topic, on the so uh, situation on the topic and on the, uh, of today's session in uh, the United States of America, Latvia, Estonia and Ukraine, but I hope that it was not the only intention when the Russian delegation was promoting this specifically selected topic. Uh, we would like to mention that the uh, named report presented by the Russian Federation 
uh, didn't respond to the concerns of uh, Ukraine on the situation and on the public representation and the freedoms and the rights of the uh, citizens of the Russian Federation of Ukrainian origin. And we believe that our call for OEC institutions to give immediate attention to uh, uh, this situation and assistance for Russian Federation to fully comply with the, its relevant and our relevant OEC commitments is valid. I thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor now to Estonia, followed by Armenia. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, since my country was uh, mentioned today, I would also like to use the right of reply on my national capacity and comment on some of the claims made by the Russian delegation and uh, a representative of the civil society regarding the undetermined uh, citizenship question in Estonia. Well, civil and economic rights are granted to all persons re residing in Estonia, its citizens or non-citizens alike. And the persons with uh, undetermined citizenship have travel documents, resident permits, right to equal treatment, access to social services, as well as the right to vote at local elections, which can be used by all long-term legal residents of Estonia. Also, residents with undetermined citizenship can travel visa-free both to the EU and Russia. Well, it is also important to stress that uh, persons with undetermined citizenship in Estonia enjoy, enjoy more rights than foreseen in the 1954 convention uh, relating to the status of stateless persons, as has been reaffirmed by the UNHCR on several occasions. The government is actively promoting, but not imposing the acquisition of the Estonian citizenship and creating all necessary conditions to this end. We encourage persons with undetermined citizenship to apply for Estonian citizenship and we have changed the Citizenship Act on several occasions. Therefore, the number of persons with undetermined citizenship has decreased remarkably, comprising of the fraction of 6% of the population in 2017 and if we compare, it was in 1992, it was 32. So it is more than five-fold decrease during the last 25 years. I would also like to take this opportunity to remind you all that citizenship cannot be forced to anyone. And Estonia's position is that every person should have the right to choose his or her citizenship. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador, for those points of clarification. I would like to give a floor now to the last delegation to exercise rights of reply, the delegation of Armenia. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'd, I would like to respond to the statement just delivered by the Azerbaijani delegation, which I believe was in response to the statement uh, that I delivered earlier uh, today. So first I would like to go to my initial statement, and I would like to quote my initial statement. Uh, there have been cases of use of force against the realization of the right of self equal right and self-determination of peoples, which led to mass and grave human rights violations and eventually to violent and protracted, protracted conflicts. This has also been a case for Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. I did not mention the name of Azerbaijan, but I'm certainly thankful that Nagorno Azerbaijan... Is that Azerbaijan, please? Uh, excuse me. Intervention, please. Excuse it's me. The separatist view, and I, can't I, this. I would like to kindly ask I, both delegations. No, Nagorno Karabakh we've seen it is for a number of years. Azerbaijan territory. I mean, this is. Uh, so sorry this for this. He, he just doing separatist uh, statement. I understand sorry. that the Azerbaijan delegation is raising a point of order. Yes. So please make your point, and then I would like to give a floor back to. Az okay. Azeri delegation has a point of order, and then I would like to ask Armenian delegation to finish uh, the right to reply, and then we will move to our introducer, who will conclude her remarks. So Azerbaijan has a point Thank of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. No need to repeat. Nagorno-Karabakh is recognized by the all countries here as a territory of Azerbaijan, and more than 20, 24 years, he's under the occupation of the Armenian Republic. 
So uh, the Armenian delegation tries to ignore the old international norms and OEC commitments. Now he's going. Now he is going to say about Nagorno-Karabakh. It's like the Armenian Republic, uh, let's say, the territory. So please uh, call these uh, separatist views to stop. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the point. I would I'm like making to another ask point our, uh, I would like to ask Armenia to exercise no, their right to reply. No, this uh, is point of order. Yes, please, point of order. So it's the first time that one delegation stops uh, the other delegation for, from delivering its statement by calling that this delegation does not have uh, right to recall the name of uh, certain territory in the OEC region. It is my earnest request that you call this delegation to order. We cannot discuss anything like this in the HDM when one delegation cannot make a, uh, a point of uh, uh, lie. And this, you should not take such kind of point of orders and you should show leadership and you should ask the delegation to let the other delegation to uh, make its points. I mean, we are not here. She is claiming that I'm doing separatist view. I mean, you can go to Azerbaijan and behave like this in Azerbaijan where there is no freedom of expression. This is HDM. And you have to be bound by the rules of the age team. This is preposterous when one delegation does not let the other delegation to make a right of reply by calling the other delegation views as a separatist. And second, Armenia is a participating state and Armenia does not recognize Nagorno-Karabakh as Azerbaijan. Please bear with that and let us to be in dialogue, not in such kind of confrontation. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you very much. I would like to thank both delegations. I would like to bring to your attention that the right of um, to write to reply uh, only to delegations, and if time permits, and I believe we still have a few minutes, delegations can exercise once again the right of reply. So I would like to, according to the documents which I have in front of me, the point of order can be raised, but we are at the stage of rights of uh, to reply. So I understand that Armenia is the right to reply, or would you like to be allocated an additional minute, minute to finish your right to reply? I have still minute and I will yes, so you would like to execute this? Yes, Thank of you. course. Thank you. And, I'm, and Azerbaijan self-identifies itself as the party who uh, uh, perpetuates mass atrocities against people of Nagorno-Karabakh by reacting to my statement, though my statement did not initially have the uh, mentioning of Azerbaijan. Second point. There is no any UN security resolution which demands withdrawal of uh, uh, troops of Armenia from Nagorno-Karabakh. This is absolute lie. And second, it's preposterous to see how a delegation of a permanent state of the OEC can dehumanize the entire population of 100,000 people by claiming that they do not have human rights and no human rights should be exercised until they became a part of Azerbaijan. This uh, shows which country is Azerbaijan and all these gongos and all these, you know, uh, trolls around shows that, you know, this country wants only a monologue. It wants to talk to itself and the fact that the first time right of reply was interfered and was my right of reply was attacked by Azerbaijan is the best indicator of this. I thank you. I would kindly ask Azerbaijan to indicate if they would like to uh, get another right to reply. If this is the case, one right no, one, 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 okay. One, one, one. I'm just reading the rules. The right should be exercised only once, and I apologize. Uh, what I would like to ask both delegations to allow our introducer to reflect on a number of very important points which were made by a number of speakers. And uh, with your permission. Um, May I do one intervention? Just a little, 30 minutes. I, as I said, I? Uh, um, please allow me to give the floor to the introducer. Uh, okay. I think we've had a number of very important points made by the speakers. We've had a number of good examples from the participating states. Uh, with your permission, I would like to give a floor to introducer. Um, uh, Dr. Dimitriana Petrova would agree to uh, make uh, closing remarks. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, we have five to seven minutes, please. Uh, 
I hope I um, would uh, reflect the sentiment of many people in this room and outside who are sitting here and listening to this session and thinking to themselves, well, how great that actually this forum exists at all. Uh, I hear that the, the organization um, has faced difficulties recently, but when I hear this kind of discussion and the issues that we have known all along for many, many years, the issues of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, the issues of citizenship, uh, or lack thereof, the issue of non-citizens uh, in Latvia and Estonia. Uh, now the newer issues of uh, Ukraine versus Russia. The shivering new Cold War language now between Russia and the United States. When we hear all this, my thoughts are with the OSCE and my wishes are that ODIR really lives up to its mission because I think it's absolutely crucial that the issue of political participation is upheld by the uh, uh, ODIR monitoring uh, of elections. And um, it's very important for uh, states to confirm, to recommit to election monitoring by ODIR in the OSCE. I think uh, that's something indispensable. And there are also further uh, forums where separate issues can be taken, including Nagorno-Karabakh, as far as I know, remind me, but I think there is a, a process, maybe it's stalled, maybe it doesn't work well, um, under the office of the OSC with uh, certain stakeholders, participants, and so on, probably it's time to revisit the efficiency uh, of this frozen conflict and probably a, a number of other frozen conflicts in the OSCE space, which, uh, frozen or not, see that they can easily be reopened. Now, let me uh, just uh, bring your attention back to one of the central issues of this session, which is uh, equal political participation. Now, if we, for a moment, if we forget about um, interstate tensions, conflicts, potential conflicts, and look inside participating states. It is our ideal that we have equal participation and that equality is meant to, to be about the weaker. And the weaker, those that are the historically or the structurally disadvantaged. And that's why, uh, that's why rightly many of the speakers talked about women. Um, certain delegations and others quoted figures about women's participation. Uh, now, if we look across the region, we are still, we're still very far from parity, for gen from gender parity. Uh, and if we, believe, if we look at positions of power, I think you will agree that mayors are a powerful figure everywhere. Mm. Mayors in the OSC region, only 12%. Uh, are, are women, and uh, only about a quarter of MPs are women. I don't think we can be content with this. Yes, it's a, these are small steps that are taken, but they should be taken. Now, the, the, the issue of quotas was mentioned. Now, here I want to, to make a, a brief remark about quotas, uh, which have been used in many countries on gender, but also on disability sometimes even on ethnicity, are they good or bad? Now, uh, the position in equality law is inconclusive. There are experts, experts are divided. There are people, experts on equality law, on anti-discrimination law, who believe that quotas are a very legitimate type of affirmative action, of positive action. Others disagree and think that there are means that are better than quotas because it may be used for the wrong reasons and they're quite mechanical. Uh, now, we can argue about this. Uh, my position would be rather uh, in favor of quotas, but only to the extent that they serve the purposes of 
equality. And the legal basis for, for this view is that in the um, modern understanding of the right to equality, positive action is considered not an afterthought, not some kind of an additional consideration to equal weaker. On the contrary, positive action is considered to be at the heart of equal uh, participation and, in fact, of equality understood, not just as non-discrimination, not just as equality of treatment, not just equality of opportunity, but this larger modern understanding of equality as equality of capabilities, to quote Amartya Sen, or equality indeed of participation. So I would say that quotas are, are a very legitimate means, but they should be used with caution and only up to a point where they actually are useful and equalize. Because we also have around the world cases when positive action has been used uh, excessively, mm -hmm. starting with very good intentions, but then going to uh, a situation where after equalizing opportunity, it in fact serves the stronger group. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful about the balance. But human rights law uh, and actually democracy should always, democracy advocates should think about who is the weaker and look at striking the balance. And it goes for ethnic minorities, for persons with disabilities, and other disadvantaged groups. And that, that's why I, I would like to reiterate the things that I said. It's very important to actually have anti-discrimination law, because what are we talking about? We can be uh, um, you know, having a number of political discussions, but if we also look at, uh, at human rights, and not just human rights, but human rights law, then the question is, OK, how can we make a human rights law case uh, on these issues. For example, there's the issue of thresholds, 3% or not 3% as an electoral threshold. The answer to this, well, a threshold ex exists in many, many countries in the OSCE region. In itself, it's not objectionable. Then the question, however, is whether or not a certain legislative or policy measure, criterion, rule, practice, provision, has a disproportionate impact, a discriminatory impact on a certain group, making it vulnerable. And if that is the case, so it's not the quota as such, it's not the threshold as such, but how it works. If it can be shown how it works historically and structurally, then take the case to court if possible. If not, raise the case at political fora like this one. Uh, I think this, this forum is extremely important. It's political. It's not a legal. It, we're not in a court. It's political. These are political, political discussions. So naturally, they become hot from time to time. Uh, that's fine. Uh, and uh, as a human rights uh, activist, uh, I strongly believe in the possibility of having this political conversation, the clashes, the, the, the verbal wars, because the alternative is nonverbal. It's other kinds of wars. So I, I, I very much, I'm very encouraged that we have the verbal wars. And uh, I, I'm, uh, uh, I dread a situation where the OSCE and ODIR would actually be disempowered from conducting and facilitating these verbal wars. I actually welcome them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would like us to thank uh, Dr. Petrova for her remarks. Thank you very much indeed. I would also like to thank all the uh, speakers uh, and participants in this um, session. Uh, before we uh, finalize the session, I would like to briefly mention remarks. Obviously, our thanks should also go to the translators. Thank you very much indeed uh, for excellent translation. Um, for the next uh, session, I would like to remind you that the speakers list is open one hour before the session. Um, so uh, please do register yourself uh, in advance. Um, technical remarks, uh, please leave your headsets uh, and receivers in the room. Um, I would also like to encourage you, I've looked at the list of side events. We have four excellent side events. Uh, most of them will start at quarter past one. So uh, please do pay attention to the side events which will be taking place during the lunchtime. Uh, there are a number of very interesting side events. So um, once again,
And I would like to, to thank all uh, the participants, all the delegations, and first of all, I would like to thank Azari and Armenian delegation for allowing us to give introducer time to conclude with her remarks. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all of you and have a good lunch break. Thank you.